Hello there and welcome to Global Business Africa. We'll be giving you insight into Africa's business and financial markets. I'm Uche Okoronkwa coming to you from Kenya's capital, Nairobi. Let's start with a look at the markets. My emerging market equities made some cautious moves today with Beijing stocks falling victim to another round of selling. And that's on fears about a U.S. ban on several Chinese tech firms. We saw MSCI's index of developing world stocks set to book a weekly loss of nearly 2%. It's a third straight week in the red. It was a pretty quiet day on the continent, however. South Africa's JSC closed for Women's Day. Nigeria's all-share index was up just slightly, with MTN topping the gainers list on news that it is on track to meet a divestment target set in March after raising about 140 million US dollars from asset sales. Now, also coming up on the show today. Foreign firms start receiving licenses to trade in Ethiopia. Uganda Airlines confident of taking to the skies this month. And we look at the African family that's hoping to create its own comic universe to rival giants in the industry. Well, let's start off the show in Ethiopia. The country has taken its first steps in liberalizing its tightly controlled financial sector. Now, Ethiopia has granted a business license to a foreign-owned company for the first time. The license issued on Thursday by the Central Bank of Ethiopia went to a unit of the New York-based Africa asset finance firm, Ethio Lease. The latest move signals Prime Minister Abe Ahmed's, Ahmed's progress with the economic reforms which he pledged when he took office last year. Now, Ethio Lease is set to bring in a whole range of leasing services for multiple sectors in the country. It will offer long-term leases worth about $600 million to companies and individuals that can't import themselves uh, due to foreign exchange shortages in the country. Well, let's delve further into this story with Coletta Wanjohi. She joins us now in Addis Ababa. Coletta, great to have you on the show. Now, a whole raft of reforms, uh, especially in the financial sector, they seem to be kicking off in Ethiopia right now. Uh, we saw them just pass a bill that will open up the financial sector uh, to Ethiopians in the diaspora who want to invest at home. We also saw Kenya's Equity Bank. It has acquired a license to expand its operations in the country. What else is going on uh, in the financial sector in terms of these reforms? Well, Uche, there's a lot going on, especially in terms of easing business and making it easy, especially for the private sector. Now, with uh, Dr. Abi Ahmed as the new prime minister, he's made a call that the private sector needs to be more active. And he says it has to be both local and international. So because of that, we are seeing a lot of reforms around laws. We are seeing the investment law being reformed. Uh, these are laws that have been there for about, the investment law has been there for about, for the past eight years, and it was a bit restrictive. Well, it, it would restrict, especially foreign investors in, uh, from a accessing certain sectors but now the government is saying let everyone uh, like ev everybody or who is interested who's got the money who's got the capital let them invest in as many sectors as possible well we are also seeing the fact that the financial sector is also opening up more to the local uh, investors whereby uh, even the small and medium enterprises are being given priority and being told you do not need as uh, asset collateral in order to obtain loans no you can get uh, soft what we would call soft collateral so there's easing of the, all these laws and for those who've got good business ideas but do not have collateral or do not have uh, collateral then we are having the government putting up a scheme that will be able to support their ideas all these with the, with the purpose of ensuring that there's more business coming out of Ethiopia and in that way probably more foreign foreign currency coming in and that way the, the government will, able, will be able to, to I mean to boost its uh, foreign reserve revenue Right. Well, Colette, the government is also opening up other key sectors to foreign investment, uh, such as the telecom industry. Last we heard uh, from that sector, the Communications Regulatory Authority, it was accepting bids. So who are some of the possible uh, new entrants uh, we'll see coming in? Give us an update on what they're doing there. Well, currently we're having it, it's, uh, the bidding process where we have different, I mean, there's an open time where any person or any company in the, in the I mean globally can be able to put in a bid and uh, say if they, do, they would want to, to either buy uh, because the, the liberalization has been made in such a way that uh, one company can be able to buy um, minority stakes into the current uh, telecom company Ethio Telecom or 
or uh, those who would want to be individuals or uh, to be independent players because they are going to give two more uh, I mean positions for independent players in the telecommunication sector. It is viable and it is very, very profitable and very attractive to many because remember, Uche, we have uh, subscribers currently of about 40, over 40 million and about over 10 million who are interested in internet and data connection. So it is very, very fruitful I mean, for any company that will be here. We can, we can speculate because at the moment we do not have already the companies, uh, they have not been announced, those who put in bids but we can easily speculate within Africa we are looking at MTN we're looking at uh, uh, Voda, we're looking at uh, Vodacom we can also look at Vodafone it's possible that they would be putting in a bid uh, neighboring Kenya we're looking at Safaricom uh, probably they might want to come in and probably bring in the technology we know they've got the M-Pesa they might want to, to come and explore that here we are also looking at uh, countries for example from Vietnam we've had uh, the state telecommunication company in Vietnam Vietel having expressed interest much earlier and there are also some companies from Egypt as well. So this is what the, the, the Ethiopian company, I mean, country has, uh, government has described that uh, the bid is attracting what they would call international tier one uh, competitors. So it's likely to be very interesting once we get the, I mean, the names of all this, but that's just speculation for now. Mm. And of course, a similar shakeup in other key sectors such as power, such as oil and mining as well. We have to leave it there, Coletta, but many thanks for your insights. Of course, that was Coletta Wanjoy joining us there in Addis Ababa. And moving on now, a new mobile banking service has launched in South Sudan. It is changing how business is being carried out in the country. Many transactions in Sudan, South Sudan are by cash, and it is it, it, it hopes uh, the new technology will help change this. Here's CGTN's Patrick Oyet reporting. A bank account holder can now use a mobile phone to transfer money from one bank account to another. An account holder can also purchase goods using mobile banking service. The service was launched by Kenya Commercial Bank or KCB in South Sudan. Some business people in Juba are reacting to the introduction of the service. It will be very easy for someone to do any transaction from one account to the other, transferring money from one account to the other, be able to check their balance and, and get to do this transaction without the need of even going to, the, to any of the KCB's uh, branches. So it gets to make life very easy. Kenya Commercial Bank says it will continue to invest in technology to improve its services. The same way we came into South Sudan in 2006, when there was more uncertainty, we will still not shy away from investing in South Sudan because we are there for, for, for long. We are not a temporary investor in South Sudan. Most of South Sudan's banks are in the capital, Juba. Mobile banking service is expected to make transfer of money to rural areas easier. Uh, we are all excited because we think it is a huge opportunity for us really to expand uh, 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 financial inclusion to, to our people because with this one now, even where there are no bank branches, people will be able to, to, to benefit from uh, financial services, whether it is transfers or things like that. South Sudan's government is encouraging financial institutions across the country to come up with technologies that would discourage people from carrying large sums of cash. There have been rise in cases of robbery in the country because many here have been carrying huge sums of cash. With the coming of mobile banking, it is hoped doing business would become easier and cases of robbery with violence would reduce. Patrick Oyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. Well, let's move on now to our corporate headlines today. Zambia's mining ministry has asked Glencore subsidiary Mopani Copper Mines to rescind its decision to close two shafts in the country. Now, on Thursday, Mopani announced the shutdown, citing that it had always been part of its plans. However, it's yet to confirm how many jobs will be lost by the non-renewal of contracts associated with the closure of the two uneconomic shafts at its Nkana site. Meanwhile, Canadian mining firm Barrick Gold is looking to sell its Tongon gold mine in Côte d'Ivoire. This is, a, is as it ramps up asset disposals following its purchase of Rand Gold resources. The company is currently working with the Bank of Nova Scotia to identify buyers for the asset. It aims to start a formal sale process in the near term for part of all its stake. And Kenya's biggest bank by assets, KCB Group, plans to boost its investments in South Sudan after seeing positive economic indicators in the cash-strapped nation. 
With a balance sheet of nearly $204 million, KCB is set to reopen all its branches in South Sudan. The lender will also introduce mobile banking in the country as it targets to grow its individual-based customers by the end of next year. In ride-hailing giant, Uber's stock price fell 9% at the start of trading on Friday. That's a day after the company released a crushing second quarter earnings report. The firm missed on analysts' top-line estimates by posting a massive $5 billion loss in the quarter ending June 30th. Now, Uber's latest decline has been attributed to stock compensations following its IPO earlier this year. And that's a look at our corporate headlines. Well, let's take a quick break now, still to come on the show. Uganda Airlines confident of taking to the skies this month. And the plastic recycling plant in Kenya that can't get enough materials to recycle. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global business. Only on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Okay. We'll Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible? And why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Sumitra Hello, Nairobi. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. Let's head to Uganda now. The country's national carrier, Uganda Airlines, has announced that it will, it will commence commercial flights at the end of this month. The airline will, in its first phase, start with flights to Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, Mogadishu, Kilimanjaro, Mombasa, Bujumbura, and Juba. It is expected to add more destinations, including Kigali, Goma, Lusaka, Johannesburg, Harare, and Bangui in the second phase. Now, in 2001, the government, headed by President Yoweri Museveni, liquidated the carrier due to mismanagement and accumulated debt. However, Uganda's government announced plans to revive the carrier in a bid to reduce the annual local expenditure, which was estimated at $420 million. Well, let's find out more from Michael Baleke. He joins us now in Kampala. Michael, well, very welcome to the show. Now, of course, uh, we know the national carrier plans to begin this commercial flights uh, by the end of this month, almost two decades, by the way, uh, after it went defunct due to poor management, of course. Now, the government says this is all about promoting tourism and, of course, national pride in Uganda. Uh, but what are they going to do differently this time around? Hello, Uche. Of course, let's look at the numbers first. Um, the Civil Aviation Authority says that... Uh, the, the number of people that are going through Entebbe Airport, uh, which is the hub of the Uganda Airlines, has gone up. Uh, they're putting the numbers to 1.8 million last year, up from 1.7 million, 1.6 million in 2017. And we also understand of that 1.8 last year, the domestic uh, or the nationals, Ugandans, were 25,000. So Uganda Airlines is looking at these numbers to influence especially the domestic and the home market uh, to fly with them. And the plan is to encourage Ugandans uh, to use the flight and own it, a plan they think will help, uh, of course, help them out, outpace the foreign carriers. Uh, the airline is also, of course, promising lower fares. Uh, we have seen already they have put uh, promotional fares at almost... Uh, 
uh, $200 less than the current market price. Now, if that is sustainable, it's a question that we have to answer. And uh, of course, the other ambitious plan in the, is to market Uganda as a, uh, a tourist destination. And with this, there is hope uh, they can attract travelers uh, mainly from new markets like China. Um, Uche? Mm. Well, Michael, opinions are actually still divided uh, in Uganda over the revival of the national carry. Actually, some from the government as well as the central bank are still opposing it. Why is this? And also looking uh, at the state uh, of the government's fiscal position, can it financially take this on? Well, Uche, a national airline is ideal. Uh, for Uganda, and the contribution uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, the airline shall again, of course, open more revenue streams that will be coming into Uganda. We're talking about air navigation charges, we're talking about handling charges, uh, we're talking about, of course, uh, uh, tour companies are going to get money out of this. But also, we understand, like you have said, um, experts say, Uche, that. Uh, Gov some governments that are handling major airlines across the world, some of these, these are rich countries that ha have state-owned airlines, are struggling to stay afloat. And can Uganda take on this task? Uh, well, the country is not earning much uh, from its exports. It's not making enough revenue. The government is overwhelmed with the health uh, sector, with, uh, we're talking about um, education sector. And uh, above all, uh, government is struggling, of course, to fund its ambitious infrastructure program. We're talking about hydropower dams, roads, we're talking about oil and gas, the pipeline, uh, uh, of course, to Tanzania. And then it's also building another major airport in western Uganda. So the airline, of course, has already recruited pilots. It has some of the best uh, paid pilots earning thousands of dollars. And I believe and it has not yet taken to the skies. Of course, mm. unless it makes this money and unless maybe they are planning to borrow money, uh, well, they may not meet the cost of the operations. Mm. And of course, uh, Africa's uh, commercial uh, airline market right now is highly competitive. Uh, the, the airline has ordered just about four Bombardier jets. Two have arrived in the country. Uh, so given in light of Africa's competitive uh, airline market or travel market right now, uh, how, what do the experts say about how uh, Ugandan airlines will fare going forward? Well, like you said, Uganda has ordered four Bombardier uh, uh, jets, two are already here, but it has also ordered um, two Airbus larger size planes, A330 NEOs, at worth about $20 million. But still, aviation experts believe uh, the planes are small and do not adequately position Uganda airlines to counter the competition on the market. It means cargo routes, uh, cargo uh, along the, the major routes, like the long haul routes, must either be shipped or uh, placed on alternative planes, which creates unnecessary delays, and especially for passengers who love flying with their cargo. So exports, uh, uh, experts argue uh, that instead of uh, this outright buying of, of planes like the way Uganda is doing, maybe Uganda Airlines should consider uh, leasing larger aircrafts, uh, which are more cost effective, and uh, investing in higher uh, traffic routes. Uh, for example, when we talk about the Middle East, Dubai, Doha, uh, these are the routes that are making money. Most Ugandans are going there, and the rest of the world is going there, South Africa. These routes will make more money. but. Uh, this can only be done through an a cost-effective way, and the model is leasing. Otherwise, uh, it, the cost may, may be unbearable, Uche. Mm, quite right, Michael. And of course, it hasn't kicked off just yet. We'll wait till the end of the month. Uh, it seems to be a wait-and-see situation. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Michael. Of course, that was Michael Baleke joining us there in Kampala. Now let's move on. It has been almost two years since Robert Mugabe was ousted as president of Zimbabwe. Emerson Mnagagwa took over in November 2017, promising change and a revival of the country's economy. But of course, Zimbabwe's economy remains battered and bruised, and inflation continues to skyrocket. Take a look. Zimbabwe may have new leadership, but it still has old problems a flailing economy that's heading into a hyperinflation. The main reason that there is a lack of confidence in the economy and in this is because uh, the political reforms that are necessary aren't being tackled in a manner that is satisfying the international community. So one of the findings we, we discovered last week when we were in, 
in Harare is that I think this government, the Mnangagwa government right now, is aware of the fact that the, this mantra of reform, reform, reform is being pushed. Despite the slow pace of reform, many Zimbabweans living here in Johannesburg say that they're happy that Robert Mugabe is no longer at the helm. But for the majority, it's still a painful struggle. They have to work long hours to save enough money to send back home. And with the rapid rise of inflation, that money in Zimbabwe is not worth much. So many of them have resorted to buying simple goods like oil and rice just to send back. All of this behind me is destined for Bulawayo. We, we do not regret the military intervention in 2017, a coup or no coup, uh, because it, we, it needed to happen. But we made a, a, a fundamental mistake. Uh, when the coup happened, we needed to constitute a government of national unity whose focus was going to rebuild the Zimbabwean economy. The government has stopped all use of any foreign currency, declaring the Zim dollar sole legal tender. Shelton Moyo lives here in Johannesburg. He buys what he can, but sending it home is also becoming expensive. Uh, they cannot have access because of the price change. Uh, let's say it's now a challenge. For them, whether you support is feed the cows whose health is deteriorating first. It's 200 rand per bag to buy, then to send home, it's 100 rand. The inflation rate in Zimbabwe was at 6.48 percent in 2009. Inflation is now at 175.66 percent. Samitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Now here in Nairobi, a $44 million plastic recycling factory is running at a third of its capacity. It was set up... ...courtyard of loose... ...tackling the world's spiraling plastic waste crisis. But despite coming up with this initiative, Lucy's machines remain idle, as she cannot get anything close to the 2,000 tons of plastic she wants to recycle each month. We have the packing bed machine there, so they one day they need 25 tons. I going to the, uh, that machine stop for the packing bed machine. Many African nations struggle to recycle plastic. Poor waste collection lies at the heart of the problem. And just like many developing nations, Kenya has no recycling infrastructure, leaving waste pickers to scavenge through trash bags outside homes and stinking mounds of refuse at dumps so as to recover the types of plastic that Lucy's factory needs. Companies like Coca-Cola and Unilever have founded Petco Kenya to subsidize. How much the workers? We have electrician, also high for workers. Uh, anything we must pay them, and also run to this place. Due to the pressure received from governments and environmentalists, Coca-Cola, Nestle, Unilever, and Diageo formed an African plastic recycling alliance in March, and in Ghana. Eight beverage companies have started the Gripe Recycling Initiative and are courting a Canadian company to set up a factory producing textile fibers. According to an October 2018 Greenpeace report, consumer brands Coca-Cola, Unilever and Nestle are among the world's biggest producers of plastic trash. Global policy experts say Africa's low rate of plastic collection could be transformed if customers pay a deposit refunded when plastic bottles are returned, just as glass bottles. Brian Toussaint, CGTN. Meanwhile, the African Development Bank has been working on a massive project to drastically improve transport in Cote d'Ivoire's capital of Abidjan. The aim is to transform the city's infrastructure as well as facilitate economic activities. While CGTN's Penina Karibe caught up with Marie-Laure Akin Olugbade from the African Development Bank to find out whether the transport project, estimated to have cost just over $860 million, is still on track to meet its 2021 deadline. Today we, we expect that the deadline will be met and maybe with even some, 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 some good prospect that this bridge could be delivered ahead of time. What is the expected impact of this project once it's complete? We think that this is a, a bridge that is going to significantly enhance all the urban function in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in Abidjan, but it will also, uh, of course, significantly reduce the congestion. During the, the, the processing of the project, uh, uh, our team estimated that uh, the annual cost of 
um, lack of efficiency in the uh, public uh, transport system could cost about 5% of the GDP to the country. So we believe that with this type of infrastructure, once completed, we will have a significant reduction in this cost. The project is really meant to uh, link up the, the west side of the, the city of Abidjan, and we are linking this west part, western part, to the eastern part, which is uh, the direction basically to uh, Ghana and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Burkina Faso. So this whole uh, corridor also will, uh, has also a, a regional dimension in the sense that we are going to be able to, to transport goods from the port of Abidjan all the way to the interland countries of Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. We also see a lot of impacts in terms of uh, um, you know, the, the, the environment. And for that, we have actually partnered with the Green Environment Fund, who is providing some financing to this project, about seven or eight million dollars, because they are particularly interested in the reduction of greenhouse emission, of course. And here in this project, we have calculated that we are maybe probably about a million a ton that could, be, that could be saved on an annual basis. Are there any other projects uh, you're focusing on outside of Abidjan? In Côte d'Ivoire, we have a portfolio of about $2.2 billion in total. This is a portfolio that has significantly grown in the last uh, three, four years. It has been multiplied by, I think, uh, six, uh, no, between 2013 and 2018, this portfolio has been multiplied actually by eight. And in this portfolio, we do a lot of uh, 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 transport infrastructure, but not just uh, actually uh, roads, but also uh, we are now investing and we are looking at, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, airport airline industry, which is another mode of transport that is critically needed in, uh, in, in West Africa. And this is about 50%. 50% of all that we do in Côte d'Ivoire is around the transport infrastructure development. And then about 25% is energy. And here we are working both uh, in terms of uh, generation, but also uh, in connection, distribution. And then the third, but not the least, and this is uh, an area that is growing. I must say that uh, three, four years ago, agriculture was not such a big area of emphasis for us in, uh, in Côte d'Ivoire. And uh, we are now investing big in, uh, in the agriculture sector and really through what we call the spatial agro-industrial processing zone. So we are really um, exploring this, uh, this idea and actually already implementing it in a, in a number of areas. Infrastructure development is one of the key focus areas for the bank and we've seen China as well champion the Belt and Road Initiative, a big deal here in the African continent. How does the bank work with China in regards to infrastructure development? We, we, the bank has a very good uh, relationship to with, uh, with, uh, with China. As you know, China is a shareholder of the, of the bank and is also a, a major donor of, the, of the, the, the African Development Fund. So uh, this, is a, this is a relationship and, 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 and we have very strong support actually from, from China. And this support is uh, not only in terms of being uh, uh, members of both the African Development Bank and the Fund, but also uh, by the provision of, uh, of a $2 billion facility, which is called the Africa Growing Together Fund, which is a facility that uh, basically uh, the bank administers on behalf of China and in co-financing projects that have been identified by the bank. While you're watching Global Business Africa, let's take a quick break now, still to come. Huawei unveiled its own operating system called Harmony as an alternative to Android. And why the World Health Organization is concerned about how much time children are spending in front of an electronic screens. Business in Africa is at the crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges, from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride 
as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what do you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are these stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Just about half past the hour, let's recap today's top headlines. A UN report now says the Central African Republic uh, uh, is could be getting uh, safer as, of course, a peace deal has been assigned between the government and rebel group groups uh, there. Now, according to figures from the peacekeeping mission in the country known as MINUSCA, the number of attacks on civilians has reduced drastically in the recent past. Up to about 565 attacks and human rights violations were recorded between January and June, compared to 1,674 cases recorded within the same period in 2018. And more migrants have arrived in Italy despite the passing of tough laws which are aimed at curbing illegal migration. A video has emerged of a small fishing boat docking on a secluded Italian beach and later dropping off around 40 migrants. It is not yet known how the boat managed to evade Italian authorities before landing on Punta Bianca in Agrigento. Now most of the migrants are thought to have come from Tunisia. And Tunisian Prime Minister Youssef Chahed has announced his official candidacy for the presidential elections. Now, Chahed was not selected by the country's ruling Enahada party as its candidate. The Islamic movement opted for Abdel Fattah Muru, the current parliament speaker, to run for office. And an estimated 2 million Muslims have gathered in the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia for the annual Hajj pilgrimage. As one of the five pillars of Islam, every able-bodied Muslim who is financially fit is required to take this journey at least once in their lifetime. Well, the pilgrims will walk around the Kaaba, a cube-shaped structure at the Grand Mosque of Mecca, at least seven times. They, of course, will partici participate in the symbolic stoning of the devil. And that's a recap of today's top headlines. Now, Chinese tech firm Huawei has unveiled its new operating system called Harmony. The announcement came during its developer conference in the Chinese city of Dongguan. Now, the company says the new system is lightweight, it's compact and powerful. It will first be used for smart devices such as watches and in-vehicle systems. Huawei plans to roll out Harmony OS in the Chinese market first before possibly expanding overseas. Its success will depend on a dynamic ecosystem of apps and developers. Now, to encourage more people to adopt the operating system, Huawei is releasing it as an open source platform worldwide. Uh, Harmony OS is not designed just for smartphones, but for all the smart devices. So we have the capability to, to make this, this is. Uh, our OS is for the next generation OS, the, the, the leading technology for the new generation, next generation OS. So it's kind of running for all the smart devices, all AI, all the smart devices. We want it to be a global standard, not, not just the Huawei, so Harmony OS. It's a worldwide, the global Harmony OS is for everyone. And speaking of Huawei, 5G developments have initiated the launch of mobile devices that are ready for the new era of uh, communication. Many within and outside the industry view Chinese tech giant Huawei as a global leader in the field. But what lies within many of its products and devices is often forgotten. While well, CGT CGTN's Omar Khan paid a visit to one of Huawei's tech labs in South China to get a closer look at some of the core technologies the company has developed. With the unveiling of the Mate 20X smartphone, Huawei is ushering in the 5G era. But behind the glamour of the final product, and perhaps out of the spotlight, 
lies years of research and development. Uh, since the year 2009, Huawei already invested uh, around 4 billion US dollars in the 5G basic technology development, standard development, and also the equipment development. The Shenzhen-based firm has over 80,000 people working in R&D, accounting for nearly 50% of its workforce. And at one of Huawei's many labs in South China, a range of experiments and tests are being carried out to fuel the 5G rollout. Here at Huawei's Advanced Thermal Laboratory, scientists are exploring the latest in heat dissipation technology for 5G base stations. And it's exactly these units that will eventually power 5G networks and coverage. There's also this structure material lab, which was established back in 2012. Since then, engineers have studied the impact of harsh weather conditions and diverse environments on 5G equipment. Scientists say the units will have to be able to withstand corrosive substances, fluctuating temperatures and water. So we've got coating technologies to avoid snow or uh, water accumulation on the surface of antenna cover uh, to make sure that the, the, the covered snow won't prohibit signal transmission. These base stations will eventually be placed outdoors in various exposed areas. Engineers are using in-house developed technology, known as active cooling and two-phase cooling, to ensure that networks powered by these base stations can handle any climate. 5G, the heat is also another problem. So it, the heat generated by 5G chips is far more than the 4G chips. So here we also have uh, material technology for heat dissipation. Given Huawei's unique positioning within the 5G industry, it should come as no surprise that the company wants to deliver a product that so many people are eager to experience. From a business standpoint, their determination in R&D is translating into commercial success. Until now, Huawei already signed more than 50 commercial contracts, 5G contracts, with a global leading operator. And also we already shipped more than 150,000 pieces of base stations. We are deploying and uh, the operators are commercializing the 5G network right now. With 5G-enabled phones set to be in consumers' hands in just a few weeks, what lies underneath the cover may well be an afterthought. But for Huawei and their efforts, that's a reality they'll gladly take. Omar Khan, CGTN, Dongguan, Guangdong Province. And meanwhile, in Hong Kong, protests continue as demonstrators there take over the city's international airport. Now, authorities are warning of serious economic consequences as they call for a halt to the violence. Well, CGTN's Wang Chi Wei has the latest. Another great test to public order as demonstrators dressed in black hold a sitting in the arrival area. The Hong Kong International Airport has beefed up security in case violence breaks out. The protest was prompted on social media and is expected to run for three days. In response, authorities say they will enforce stricter identity checks on passengers. Some aren't happy with the inconvenience caused by the protest. I could have checked in my luggage easily, but now I have to wait. This absolutely affects my trip. The Hong Kong protests have gone on for a month, and on many occasions, violence has broken out. In a press conference on Friday, Hong Kong police gave a briefing on the unrest. Some radical protesters have attacked others and caused destruction like arson. Now we have seen many traffic lights and road fences destroyed. I have to emphasize that tens of thousands of public demonstrations have been supported by the police over the years. In fact, we can say that these activities have been conducted peacefully, rationally and lawfully. This proof that the police will not intervene, let alone use any form of coercion, if not forced to. Earlier this week, a photo was released triggering outrage among the public. The photo shows reported protest leaders meeting with U.S. Consulate General Official Julie Ada. China summoned U.S. diplomats and lodged strong opposition to the meeting. The U.S. responded, accusing China of releasing personal information about the American diplomat. On Friday, the Chinese Foreign Ministry once again urged the U.S. to reflect on its own mistakes and stop interfering in China's internal affairs. Meanwhile, Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam held a press conference on Friday, calling again for an end to the riots. 
Hong Kong can't be messy. I believe these words also reflect the aspirations of the vast majority of Hong Kong people today. And as she met business representatives in Hong Kong, she said this recent flurry of violence will lead to long-term problems in the economy. Data shows Hong Kong's PMI, a key indicator for current and future business conditions, dipped to 43.8 percent in July, down from June's 47.9 percent. This points to a downturn that could be the worst in over a decade. Wang Qiwei, CGTN. Well, let's move on now. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is insisting on a $2 trillion valuation of state-run oil firm Aramco. Now, Prince Salman first put the value of the company in early 2016 at $2 trillion. But there, of course, there still seems to be a gap between what he would like to see and what bankers view as a reasonable market price. That, of course, is given the current wild cards or global uncertainties such as oil prices, stock prices and the global economy. Now, last April, Saudi Aramco issued $12 billion in bonds, which saw sky high demand of around $100 billion. This has given Saudi officials confidence that they can bring their IPO to the market sometime next year as they hold their first ever investor call on Monday. It's the biggest, it'll be by far the biggest company in the world. So it's a $2 trillion company. Microsoft is number two at $1 trillion. It's doubled up number two. So uh, it's just a gigantic issuance. When you have 0% bonds, uh, sovereign bonds, and a lot of advanced countries and you just don't have a lot of place to put money and when an opportunity like this presents itself it may not happen now it may not happen next year but uh, because crude oil prices are relatively low right now it kind of makes it a bit more difficult but when this thing goes uh, assuming that bond yields are still relatively low at that point this is going to be very this is going to be the biggest thing of all time so uh, it's going to it will dwarf any other country any other companies Meanwhile, the World Health Organization is expressing concern over how much time children are spending in front of electronic screens. Now, the UN agency says the mesmerizing effects of videos may be keeping young kids from building the sophisticated social skills that are central to human development. Well, CGTN's Rory Ruttenberg spoke to some parents in Los Angeles to see what they think. Like many Americans, Emily and Nathan Miller struggle over how much screen time their little ones should have. We talk a lot with other parent friends and we follow our gut. And so what's your gut? Uh, my gut is as little as we can get away with. And the World Health Organization says not that much. Baby Judah, it says, should get zero screen time. Two-year-old Liba can have a little, but very little, which in today's age parents admit isn't so easy. They're growing up in a moment where you have the Internet of Things, you have people who um, are going to be having you know, professional lives because of all of this kind of technology, and I think to have your kids exposed to zero is also a problem. And you know, we're just trying to do our best. My kid just barfed on my shoulder again. But not all screens are created equal, says Ravital Heller High. There are ed tech, you know, education technology startups and apps that are happening that where people are really basing it in learning science and, and thinking about um, educational experiences for kids, I think that those can sometimes be very valuable. The mother of one and former teacher now develops digital content. She says screen time can be a social equalizer, giving more children access to early education. She also says learning digital skills at an early age can be beneficial. The thing she actually likes to do most on the iPad and on the phone is just to like push the buttons and see what happens and like, you know, swipe from side to side. And she actually figured out how to pinch and zoom. It's not academic, but it's educational. You know, she's she's understanding cause and effect. She's learning basic digital literacy. She's problem solving, right? She figured out that the that the home button takes you out of the thing you're in. One of the problems is there's not a lot of conclusive research out there. The technology is new and it's still changing, and the long-term effects are unclear. And there's still widespread disagreement over what exactly constitutes screen time. Let's drum together. Show me the deal. You have to know your kid and you have to pay attention to your kid and pay attention to what they're consuming. I think the only wrong thing is not thinking about it. I think if you're, you know, everyone's doing their best, everyone's trying to be the best parent they can be, and you gotta make it work. Don't talk, that's only no crap. Rowie Ruttenberg, CGTN, 
in Los Angeles. Well, shifting focus now, let's take a look at how commodities perform today. Oil prices rising today with Brent crude climbing almost 3%. Now, according to the IEA, global oil demand in the first half of 2019 grew at its slowest rate since 2008. Of course, it was hurt by mounting signs of an economic slowdown and a ramping up of the U.S.-China trade war. Meanwhile, gold prices rising back above $1,500 per ounce. That's its highest in more than six years en route to its best week ever since april 2016. well let's take a quick break now still to come we meet the african family that's hoping to create its own comic universe to rival giants in the industry you don't find the stories of north africa by sitting on the sidelines No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. And no one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. to Ghana now. Overfishing is devastating the country's sea territory. The United Nations estimates that nearly 10% of the country's total population depend heavily on the crucial sector. But now in attempts to preserve its fish stocks, the Ghanaian government has temporarily shut down fishing for industrial trawlers. From Accra, here's CGTN's Nabil Ahmed Rufai with the story. Fishermen at Jamestown Beach in Accra have just returned from fishing. They didn't catch much, even though this period is the best time for fishing. Things are bad these days. We went fishing since last night, but came back with just a few catch and lots of plastic waste in our nets. Ghana's coastlines have been devastated by the side effects of economic expansion. According to campaign group the Environmental Justice Foundation, Pollution and overfishing is responsible for the depletion of one-third of fish species here. Experts estimate that these practices off the coast of West Africa cost the affected countries around $1 billion US dollars a year. The government banned fishing for artisanal fishermen from May to June in order to preserve stocks. It has also banned industrial trawlers from fishing between August and September. These industrial vessels are blamed for the overfishing. This is one big measure that we are trying to uh, do uh, to revamp the, our dwindling stocks. Uh, other measures are to ensure uh, that uh, all the fishing vessels, or the canoes, comply with our regulations, our fisheries laws, uh, so that they stay away from illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. Ghana had to import 135 million US dollars worth of fish in 2016 because of depleted domestic stocks. The fishing industry in Ghana is critical to the country's economy and the food needs of its people. But experts say the use of illegal nets, which indiscriminately catch juvenile fish before they spawn, is becoming more widespread. And those destructive methods are depleting fish stocks. Experts say the two month ban for industrial trawlers may not necessarily yield the desired results. We have a challenge in terms of how we plan it and how we are executing it. And so you are not able to get the benefits immediately. Because, you see, the trust sector is going on closure between August and September, that is an are fishing. So even if the fish move to shallow waters to, to spawn, because that is an are fishing, you are not likely to feel the impact. If you had a general closure for everybody, we are likely to do some measurement of the impact. Amafio says he wants the government to invest more in fishing sector research to effectively tackle the country's depleting fish stocks. 
we don't have a research vessel. We don't have adequate research. We, we lack the technology. Uh, even the gears that we use, we don't have a gear lab. We don't have gear technologies and all that. We need a lot of we need a we need a lot of policy direction because these are these are policy things. Emmanuel Lati wants the government to do all it can to fix the country's depleting fish stock soon. He says he and estimated three million people in Ghana, whose livelihood depends on fishing, don't want to lose their main occupation. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CGTN, Accra, Ghana. And meanwhile, over 1.5 billion Muslims across the globe are preparing to celebrate Eid al-Adha this Sunday. Three-day event, prices of sheep in Tunisia are soaring, as CGTN's Adnan Shaushi found out. The Skirtle market is located in the north of the capital city, Tunis. The Minister of Agriculture has paid a visit to the market. Samir Bittayib said the prices are reasonable this year. The state has created 156 cattle markets where the price is controlled and the sheep are in good health. Mutton prices for this year are unified. Protecting the purchasing power of Tunisians is our responsibility. On the occasion of Eid al-Adha, hundreds of farmers and sheep breeders have come from inner regions to sell the precious lamb to the consumers in the capital city, Tunis. Price is higher than last year because the cost of transportation and hay has skyrocketed in the past 12 months despite a record harvest this year. Everything is expensive. We are forced to cope with the market even if we are selling less lamb. With the Al-Adha Grand Feast approaching, sheep markets have witnessed a low customer turnout. Despite the 20% increase in the price of meat, Tunisian families consider the Eid Al-Adha as the most sacred day of the year. The middle class saves money for months to buy a sheep in this period. The lamb has cost around $260. It is not my initial budget, but I bought it for this religious day and for my children. I do not leave the market from dawn to dusk. I have fun during the week, which precedes the festivities. I like to spend time with my sheep. It's difficult to sacrifice it, but this is our religion and tradition. The Ministry of Social Affairs, 2,750 sheep will be provided for the needy families. The Ministry will also distribute financial assistance to 10,000 low-income families. Over 1.5 million muttons are now for sale at cattle markets. 400 veterinarians will be mobilized by the Ministry of Agriculture in 24 regions on Eid al-Adha. They will provide free sanitary control of sacrificial sheep. Adnan Shawashi, CGTN, Tunis. Now, we have all been wowed by superheroes, enchanted by princesses, and annoyed by villains. They all come out of Marvel, DC, or Walt Disney Studios. But it is, of course, a $1 billion market that African illustrators have struggled to break into. Now, the Alili family is hoping to create their own comic universe, which can or hopefully will someday be equal to the giants of the industry. Here's CGTN's Julie Shire with their story. <laughs> Fanny Max Comics is the vision of Jessica A. Lely and her husband. Their tough journey to pioneer an African comic book empire started six years ago. I wanted to start you know, this business for my children because I see that that's their naturally uh, gifted talent. When we came out with Fanny Max Comics, we did not have the finances. We even tried as much as going to uh, the Ministry of Arts and Culture. But then, somehow, as things always go here in, in Africa, it didn't work out. But this talented family of illustrators weren't discouraged. Their thoughts translate like poetry onto paper. And they're determined to bring to life African stories that have been buried by history. My character, Nyasha Mawari. And yeah, I think a lot of people, um, when I show my friends or just people in general, they say, yeah, she looks a lot like Wonder Woman. And to be honest, I was inspired by, you know, Wonder Woman. 
but I wanted to bring an African approach to it. These were warrior queens who were fighting for their countries and so that was what I played into character with her was to bring that history into a fictional character. So Super South Africa stands for, he fights for liberty, that, that's his thing. So um, he doesn't care where you're from or what color of skin you are. If you're being oppressed, he will stand for you. I was actually inspired by both Superman and Captain America when creating him. The Alelis have big plans to create a Vanimax universe to play a part in the billion dollar global industry. The first step is an online black and white series called BW. We want to first introduce the world to our characters and the world to the Vanimax comics brand. We really want Vanimax to be a core African comic brand that every, every kid in Africa should have a Vanimax comic toy or comic book or a t-shirt. So that's the end game basically, to be global, to be as big as Marvel and DC. Ambitious, some might say, but where else does an alternative universe start from, if not from a dream? Judy Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, before we go, here's a quick look at Africa's currencies today. We saw Nigeria's Naira weakening to 364 Naira per dollar. As, of course, falling oil prices tightened liquidity on the currency market. A dollar shortage was initially caused by a slowdown of foreign inflows. And that's after local debt market yields declined today. Meanwhile, Kenya's shilling firmed up against the dollar, supported by inflows from offshore investors, who, of course, are buying government debt amid excess liquidity in the local money markets. Well, that's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. Remember, you can send your feedback to the contacts on your screen. You can also follow us on our various digital media platforms. From me, Ucheo Koronkwo, and the rest of the team, thanks for watching.